please share with us what happened to you the other day on Twitter. But before we get into your actual, the individual tweets, can you set up what Tiananmen Square is and was? Yeah. So <clears throat> actually in mid-April of that year, 1989, a prominent member of the Communist uh, Party of China died, Hu Yaobang, and he uh, was a reformer, like a, a pretty extreme reformer, like a very capitalist minded reformer and had a pretty strong base with intellectuals and sort of this emerging middle class that because of the environment that we that we were or not we I wasn't born at the time, but because of the environment of the that of that period, right, this like uh, re trend toward uh, unipolar hegemony for Western capitalism and the fall of the Soviet in the socialist bloc, that uh, uh, that environment helped kind of breed, I think, these tensions in China. And so after his death, there were people who were mourning, students who were mourning, people who were mourning his death on Tiananmen Square beginning in mid-April of that year. As time went on, though, these these gatherings started to take on a political character and uh, that is where the cultivation i think of the color revolution uh, western back especially the u.s backed forces began to take foot and began to really take root in the protests and for a long time i mean for a long time they were peaceful right martial law where we could say like uh, where, where the communist, where the communist party and the government said, okay, this can't be happening anymore. It didn't, wasn't really called until May 20th. So there's a full month where there are gatherings and where there were conversations. The people's liberation army was in dialogue with uh, those who were gathering, who had political demands, right. For more free speech and sort of like these Western style demands that are kind of what we see with the Hong Kong protests, for example. So, over that period, it was peaceful, right? And then starting in June, early June, uh, there was incidents of violence, but they didn't happen on the square, right? There was still uh, protests, we could call it. Some call it a gathering because there were many different kinds of people there. It wasn't just people demanding. There were some people who were still mourning, some people who were just hanging out. And then there was a group of contingent that was protesting for things like some things as extreme as regime change, other things as... Uh, less extreme as just, you know, having more uh, uh, privatization or free speech or or those kind of things. And so on June 4th, though, that was where a lot of this violence took place. And it happened in the out, outside of Tiananmen Square. But the narrative that the Western media uh, uh, had was that there were tens of that. Some some of some media sort of said there were more than ten thousand students who were just mowed down by the People's Liberation Army. There was almost like a, a complete and total kind of information warfare psyop where there were just images taken out of context. The Tank Man, for example, right, where there was this individual who stands in front of a People's Liberation Army tank and he doesn't get mowed down. He doesn't get attacked or arrested or shot at. But he's just standing there and he's getting in the way of the tank and he's moving uh, he's moving in certain directions. He gets on the tank, looks and goes inside and says, hey, you know, he's talking to the, to the guy until eventually he gets down. And then people in the neighborhood say, oh, no, you've got to get out of the way. There's like a line of, you know, 10, 15 tanks <laughs> trying to trying to move across, move through the street. So really, this event became a huge propaganda moment because the hope was that through National Endowment for Democracy funding of organizations like the Beijing Workers Autonomous Federation, whose leader ended up founding another National Endowment for Democracy funded organization called the China Labor Bulletin, which was pretty instrumental in the Hong Kong protests. It was through these organizations and through these kind of like U.S. backed Western backed groups that the hope was that this event would cause the overthrow of the Chinese government. It didn't work. There was very, there was unfortunate violence. Even Reuters reported that there were 200 to 300 people, 200 to 300 people who died. The Chinese government has the same numbers. More than half of those were soldiers and police. Because at this time, throughout until Ju June 3rd, 4th, 5th, where this violence was occurring, when the violence actually started to occur, the police and the army were unarmed. And that's just the law in China, they, they don't walk around the streets with with guns, right? It may be hard to believe, 
but uh, in the United States, because we we always see police with guns, and sometimes they look like they're carrying guns that you would fight uh, a war of occupation uh, with. But in China, there were no they, they weren't carrying guns, and so they were very vulnerable to things like Molotov cocktails and uh, other. Uh, what uh, other devices and weapons that can do things like burn military vehicles, which was happening all over Beijing at that time. So this incident has been used as a propaganda talk about year after year after year after uh, after it ended as really, I think, honestly, one of the most important talking points, because it happened in a moment where the U.S. and the rest of the capitalist world was hoping that China would go the way of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was already opening its doors entirely to capitalism, was, was really uh, uh, taking shape in that way and leading to its downfall. And so they hoped that China, through this pressure, would end up in the same situation. It didn't work. So now what we have is Tiananmen Square, a quote-unquote massacre, constantly being revived every year, trends every year on Twitter, there are new articles, you know, dozens of articles written every single year in mainstream press. Uh, U.S. officials will talk about it. Secretary of State, people like that, Joe Biden, they'll talk about it. And uh, it, it's it's constantly revived in order to bring up the fact that uh, China has this moment, which can be looked at as proof that communism, the Communist Party of China, socialism, that it's all that it's bad, it's repressive. But unfortunately for that narrative, the facts say differently in terms of just how hard the Western media, how hard uh, Western capital and the capitalists have had to try to spin this in order to make it look a certain way. When, as you know, and as, as I, I'm sure your audience knows, there are so many verifiable examples of capitalist violence and Western-backed uh, violence that doesn't need such mental gymnastics and and, and propaganda twists to uh, uh, to appear as bad as it is. Saturday was the anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre, and I put up quotes because the point of the thread was that it was not a massacre. So I, you know, uh, it was about a seven, I think something like seventy tweet thread talked about Western mainstream media, how they admitted in many instances it's just they're just not pushed up to the front of the thousands of other articles claiming tens of thousands of people died that day on 1989 so i made this tweet and you know we we know the algorithm is very against these kind of tweets but it was doing quite well and then i noticed it kind of stopped right and i was like oh and usually when that's happened to me in the past i get an email saying that Someone in Germany has uh, reported me, and usually I don't get kicked off. I did that one time. I was on your program last uh, with the whole Keith Overman situation with right. Wyatt Reed, and that was for 12 hours. Uh, and can I, you just briefly tell people what happened with the Keith Overman thing? Sure. So Keith Overman replied to a Wyatt Reed tweet. He was in Nicaragua, uh, and he posted pictures uh, that of his trip, and then Keith Overman replied to him saying that Wyatt Reed was a whore for uh, dictators and i replied saying that he was that keith overman was a whore for uh corporate media for monopoly capital something of that uh, sort and then i was reported or flagged or whatever and i was uh, locked out of my account for 12 hours so i wake up on sunday morning and i uh, go onto twitter and twitter immediately tells me that i've been locked out for at least seven days uh, they say that it could be longer, but that seven days was the minimum. Immediately as I press the touch, you know, you, you touch screen phone. So I press the touch screen. The, that information goes away. And then it just says you need to delete your tweet or you're uh, ousted for seven days. You're locked for seven days. So I thought, okay, maybe they're just going to let me delete the tweet. I wrestled with appealing and I did appeal. And then I was like, look, I've never gotten a message back from Twitter in any short period of time. It's always been at least two weeks when I've been rejected like 50 times for verification. So I was not too faithful about that. So anyway, I was locked out. I immediately as I deleted the tweet, the, my countdown started and I essentially cannot do anything except DM text. I can't do anything else through DMs with followers, but I can't use my Twitter account essentially. I can just yeah. read 
Twitter. So what Twitter, and I think you were about to pull that up, what they said was that I was essentially inciting harassment and violence toward a particular group of people. In the first tweet, which was the tweet in question, they didn't cite the whole thread. It was just the first tweet. I used the term Western propagandist. So I'm guessing that who I was inciting harassment and violence toward were the Western propagandists. But nonetheless, uh, the the point, I think, of the censorship of getting me off of Twitter for a week, there were a lot, prop or not, I wish I had screenshotted it because now it's probably lost. But I noticed on one of their threads, prop or not, I don't know if you remember them, Katie, the shady uh, organization cited by the Washington Post, Bezos' is Washington Post in 2017 during the whole Russiagate fiasco. They came out with like the first blacklist of Russian disinformation, which had Black Agenda Report, Naked Capitalism, all kinds of other sources. They were like celebrating me being locked out. I don't think they knew it was temporary. I don't know how long I've got, but uh, uh, but they were like celebrating. They're like, oh, yes, Danny Haifong is gone. The the mouthpiece for the Communist Party. I was just like, really? I was watching the Celtics game at the time, so I didn't even think about it. I was like, I'm not, I'm not messing with this. But that was, you know, I, I think the reason for the censorship, though, is that there's a lot of there's a lot at stake riding on this Tiananmen Square narrative. And there were a lot of whoever they are, bots, whoever is working behind the scenes, or just people who literally believe in the propaganda around Tiananmen Square. Uh, they they have a lot uh, riding on this narrative to smear China and also to make uh, anyone who challenges this narrative out to be some sort of agent of the Communist Party, when in reality, uh, the facts are 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 pretty clear, and and that was the point of my threat to just show that even WikiLeaks, right? WikiLeaks came out with a <clears throat> a cable, a leaked cable from uh, the U.S. embassy in Beijing that that said a Chilean diplomat was observing that students were coming and going freely from Tiananmen Square on the day of June fourth, and that there was no uh, violent confrontation between the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, and the students. And that was so repressed that only the Telegraph, this like pretty, it's a, I mean, it's a big tabloid, but it's not a prominent news source. It's not a, a, new, a prominent news source of information in Western media. They were the only ones to cover that uh, leaked cable in 2011 when a lot of uh, very important leaked information came out through WikiLeaks. So let's look at, um, let's look at what you tweeted. It says, violating our rules against abuse and harassment, you may not engage in the targeted harassment of someone or incite other people to do so. This includes wishing or hoping that someone experiences physical harm. And you write, every June 4th, Western propagandists remind us of the Tiananmen Square massacre to smear China. The truth, no massacre occurred on the square. And the violence that took place in uh, Beijing during that time was part of a failed color revolution backed by the United States. So I'm not sure who you're threatening there. This is just me talking about how this isn't a controversial point that I'm making that no massacre occurred. Twitter right. thought it was. And obviously, a lot of people who have these deeply held sentiments that are anti-China think it is. But the Western media has reported time and again in different years. I mean, this isn't all just like 1989. They're all reporting from the scene. No, it's even years afterward, as you see here, Richard Roth. Right. This is what was right. that, 2009. Like, I mean, he was there. Right. Yeah, and he says there was no Tiananmen Square massacre, and you quote, right, from his piece. Right. Um, While exactly. Western media has portrayed the event as a Chinese government massacre, journalists on the ground rejected this premise. Graham Earnshaw of Reuters saw no violence in the square and said at least half the deaths that occurred were Chinese cops and soldiers. Uh, we saw uh, no bodies injured people, ambulances or medical personnel. In short, nothing to even suggest, let alone prove that a massacre had occurred. Thus wrote CBS reporter Richard Roth at the BBC. I was one of the foreign journalists who witnessed the events that night. There was no massacre on Tiananmen Square. BBC reporter James Miles wrote in 2009. In June 13, 1989, New York Times reporter Nicholas Kristof, who was in Beijing at that time, wrote, State television has even shown film of students marching peacefully away from the Tiananmen Square shortly after dawn as proof that they were not slaughtered. In that article, he also debunked an unidentified student protester who claimed in a sensational article that Chinese soldiers with machine guns simply mowed down peaceful protesters in Tiananmen Square. Now, Nicholas Kristof is not a big fan of China, so that makes his no, saying that... No, that none, of these outlets, none of these outlets are, are yeah. friends. And, and this one is interesting by Graham Earnshaw because he was not only there observing what was happening that morning, um, 
but he also was able he he's, he's one of the few people who uh, who agreed with the assessment about 200 to 300 people dying in and around this day, just not in the square. And of course, the Western media is like not covered. Well, who is actually responsible for the violence? How did that happen? Right. right? It wasn't Chinese soldiers who weren't carrying weapons, uh, uh, who were just randomly killing people. It was it was clashes, right? It was, it was right. real clashes between forces that were armed. He wrote in his memoir that the military came and negotiated with the students and made everyone, including himself, leave peacefully and that nobody died in the square. But did people die in China? Yes, about 200 to 300 people died in clashes in various parts of Beijing around June 4th. And about half of those who died were soldiers and cops, as he referred to. A WikiLeaks cable also corroborated that no violence occurred in Tiananmen Square on June 4th. The cable was from the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. It confirmed no violence occurred and that protesters freely came and left the square. Only the Telegraph has has reported on the cable little tank man propaganda conceals images such as these the truth is no major clashes between peaceful protesters and authorities occurred the violence stemmed from rioters outside the square and half the casualties were authorities facing down heavy arms and so what right. are these images so here you have the pla negotiating with the protesters sitting with them there were many yeah. instances where they would sit with them yeah they would sit with them talk with them sing with them i mean there was a mentality and attitude i mean some of this is cultural and a lot of this is political right and how you deal with uh, dissatisfied people right you don't yeah. come and hit them with batons and drag them to prison or ro run them over with police vehicles like we saw in 2020 uh, but you talk with them you try to understand the situation and this was very common and then the image underneath is right before uh, 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 as the protesters were protests were sort of gaining steam as people were gathering in the square. Uh, this is people giving PLA soldiers food, right? So this there's that this idea that the PLA is somehow like totally hated, right? That they they were just there to be repressive, but actually there were many instances where people were like, oh, you know. This, I mean, this is not an uncommon thing in China either of like having that relationship because a lot of people who are in the army in China, which is seen as like a national defense system, not like an international body to exert domination, but like an international kind of uh, a, a body, a, a national body to protect sovereignty. Many of the people who serve in the PLA are like ordinary people with families and uh, they're seen as like a representative body of the uh, of the forces that helped liberate the country. So it's a different relationship and that's never viewed in pictures in the Western media, right? right. Especially around Tiananmen Square where it's like, here's just an image of tank man in front of a tank and it's proof that the PLA was being violent that day.